Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Really appreciate you taking time to come and listen to me speak. It's quite intimidating to speak in front of uh, what is still, in my head, my principal. And I'll try my best not to uh, do anything that gets me expelled from uh, any future prospects at DCT. I do see um, Max quite a lot because I, I sit on the board of the Baxter Theater as part of my giving back and uh, trying to add value to the things that the university is doing. I feel very connected to the university because I grew up on the campus. My mother uh, taught there and studied there and uh, became the vice chancellor. And it was always an aspiration of mine when I was looking up on that hill to, to be a student there. And uh, so I felt very lucky, uh, despite uh, quite a lot of uh, challenges on my behalf, uh, to get there and graduate and, and move on and go on and, uh, and discover myself um, in the world. I almost didn't make it to UCT because I actually have a condition called dyslexia and it made it very, very difficult for me to learn how to learn. And back in the days pre-apartheid, uh, pre-94, sorry, during the apartheid times, uh, it was much more difficult to um, make a credible uh, excuse to teachers that you weren't lazy. Uh, <laughs> And that there was something really uh, uh, kind of challenging about the learning process. And I really was lucky to have uh, a mother that cared and focused her attention on moving me to the schools that uh, actually was able to support me. And I went to Westerford, and then I went to uh, UCT by the skin of my teeth. Uh, and uh, then I found learning very easy once I got into the environment of uh, you know, an establishment like UCT, which I think made the learning process at that time very relevant because we were learning politics and history at the time of Mandela whilst he was making history. And uh, I was, of course, very lucky that I would go home and get to see him coming to visit my mother. And so those connection points became very real to me. And it's really from those days that regardless of my career path, that I felt this obligation that I needed to do my bit to contribute to uh, the future of the country. I uh, am sad that we are still kind of 20 years after democracy having debates about what I think are the wrong things. Uh, some of us are discussing nationalization, which I think Max, being a recovered communist, wouldn't uh, believe. <laughs> that people are still having those discussions today. Some of us are having discussions around uh, whether uh, members of uh, our politic should be funding houses in the hundreds of millions, uh, or others are talking about uh, whether somebody can run for president, whether they're rich or not. All of these things are immaterial to the real issues going on in South Africa, which is how we get our society to create opportunities for our children. And opportunities for our children to show the type of value that they have as individuals, regardless of race, uh, regardless of uh, creed, and specifically regardless of geography. So the topic that I chose to speak about today was about talent aggregation in what I call a disaggregated society. There's three things about South Africa that make us disaggregated. Firstly, I think we are disaggregated from a racial point of view. And so regardless of our connectivity, we still tend to socialize, uh, we still tend to uh, have some barriers in, in between uh, us as race groups, which make it very, very difficult for us to fundamentally trust each other. I think we have cultural uh, disaggregation in that we haven't yet spent time looking at the things about our different cultures that can feed into the melting pot that is South Africa. So some societies focus on differences to extract value. Others focus on differences to try and build walls. And I think in some instances we've been the former. In most instances we've been the latter. Uh, the third thing that makes us disaggregated is this issue of geographies. And unfortunately we 
are still living with this legacy of apartheid era uh, construction of how our societies are organized. And so we have people that live in uh, faraway areas, uh, away from the centers of uh, both excellence in terms of uh, the institutions that we've got, like UCT. So in Cape Town, you have uh, people living in Guguletu, Kailicha, not because they've chosen those areas as places to live, not even because they're the most reasonable places for them to live relative to where they work, but because their parents live there and their grandparents live there and it's kind of part and parcel of life that people live on that uh, type of uh, distance from where they work. And so these three things make us incredibly disaggregated. And the challenge of a leader of this country um, and the challenge of the citizens that vote those leaders in is to try and aggregate talent in a way that makes society functional. And I think that uh, up until now, we've had a very, very difficult time doing that. In my book, uh, The Great African Society, I make the point that ta talent is randomly distributed. And by that I mean if you go to Guguletu, you go to Soweto, and you do an IQ test of the children living in those communities, you're going to find a fairly even distribution of highly talented individuals, average individuals, and a few stupid ones. Every community has the same dynamic. Now, we function as if that's not the case. Okay? So, what we've got is an inefficient way of organizing these resources and these talents in a manner that allows people to overcome where they're born relative to where they end up from a trajectory point of view. And so we reinforce apartheid by leaving opportunities in a geographically delineated fashion. Okay? And so that's what I'm talking about when I say we live in a society that's disaggregated. Okay? I make the point that all parents aspire for their children to have better opportunities than they have. Anybody here that's operating in any community will find this thirst and this yearning by parents of all walks of life to try and make their kids have better opportunities. The saving patterns of our country show this. The sacrifices and the spending that uh, these parents are having at these different schools where they're trying to take their children to marginally better schools than they've been in indicate to you that there's an underlying drive by parents to try and make their kids transcend their performance. Okay, so this is one thing that unites us throughout the country. Okay? In fact, this aspiration for generational upward mobility sits at the heart of sustainable, capitalist, meritocratic societies. Right? Unfortunately, we're not yet sorted out about whether we're capitalist or socialist. Okay? I think we are sorted out that we'd like to have a sustainable society. I think people, regardless of which camp they're in, fundamentally think that our society should be a meritocracy, which is that the best people should rise to the top and the best people should actually run different institutions in the country. The sustainability of that depends on people feeling that they have equal access to that opportunity. And at the moment, people are clutching at straws attracted to this very polarizing discussion around white people have had all the opportunities, it's time for black people to take them. And they're attracted to that argument precisely because they feel that there's a fundamental lack of fairness in terms of how opportunities are distributed. In now the proof, in, when you look at how hard parents are fighting for their children, is looking at the response to the failure of our public school system. Right? With class sizes generally half that of state schools and an average metric pass rate of 97% compared to just 30% of public schools, even some relatively poor parents think that private schools are worth paying for. Okay, so there's 400,000 pupils right now in public schools, which is kind of 3% of the total, and six out of 10 of them are black. So private schooling has ceased to become a racial issue in terms of a place within which white people are educated. But we still treat it as society as a second or third priority in terms of the things that government should be focusing on facilitating. 
And I make the argument in my book that in order to get the public system fixed, the private system or the independent schools have got to be supported by government in any which way they can so that you can move numbers from one side to the other. Just to give you an idea, in places like the US, where we have 5% of the student population in independent or private schools, the US is 15% when you add up charter schools and private schools. So if a wealthy nation like the US can still find it necessary to create the institutions that support uh, the public school system and alleviate some of the burdens from the public school system, surely we should do be, be doing more. There's a tragedy in this country which goes under the very uh, innocuous sounding acronym of NEETS. And this is well known to most of you, but I want to emphasize the fact. So in 2007, 2.8 million 18 to 24 year olds out of a total population of 48 million were classified as not employed, not in education, and not in training. Almost one million pupils needed multiple second chance opportunities to complete school, while 800,000 who had obtained their final school leaving certificate required further education and training. Now, this number hasn't reduced, unfortunately. So I gave you a 2007 stats. Since then, the more up-to-date stats reflect a number closer to 3.5 million students. Now, there's a fact that's been unquestioned by government so far in all of the texts that I've read, which is that 80% of public schools are dysfunctional. So that's what's driving the traffic. And unfortunately, for people like Max and others that are providing quality higher education, it's creating a clogging factor underneath where students are getting pushed through, they end up getting to tertiary education not ready to be taught, not ready to be skilled. And therefore, institutions like UCT and Stellenbosch and other institutions have to find themselves retraining a lot of these people in order to get them up to a level where they can start their course of education. This starts from the fact that we're not accepting that 80% of these schools are dysfunctional. Okay. So you have to ask yourself, what is the qualifying criteria for who makes it into the fu functional part of the public school system? And I think the answer is something that Warren Buffett's partner, Charlie Munger, calls the ovarian lottery, which is you really are at the womb of who was your mom in terms of determining your future. And that's what's happening in South Africa. It's an unsustainable way of creating talent aggregation because it fosters this reinforcement of the fact that we are still organized on the old boundaries in terms of who succeeds and who doesn't succeed, okay? So it cannot be a rational or practical way of organizing how talent is supposed to be aggregated in the country. In the current system, we are seeing a pattern of inherited meritocracy which means that parents who have done well by outperforming their peers get to pass down that privilege by bestowing to their children a private school education. In my view, this will make South Africa a society categorized by class structures that will become very, very difficult to break down in the future. There is good news, though. There's some amazing talent aggregation firms in the country. So I'll just mention three. Anglo-American has been exceptional at making sure that they can create talent aggregation strategies that suit their business model by trying to find talent, whether it be in rural communities, urban communities, but mining that talent in a way that supports them from the cradle to the grave, as it were. These are for obviously very selfish reasons. It's not because Anglo is this wonderful kind of altruistic firm, but they've figured out that as a business, they've got to find a way of creating a hub within society that functions in a way that allows for skills to be developed. Old Mutual has been exceptional at this as well. But by far the best is Alan Gray, which has actually taken empowerment and inverted it and decided that they want to make empowerment all about the ability for kids who are at risk, in my view, 
of never making it out of their communities and identifying these children pre-high school, positioning them into the right high schools, giving them uh, bursaries for uh, tertiary, and then supporting them through that journey by exposing them to mentors, by exposing them to job opportunities. And throughout that process, they're creating an environment which is very similar to the one that a privileged person would have, which equalizes the playing fields and gives black children a chance to compete on an equal footing. And I say this not because Ellen Gray paid me any money, but it is an example that within a pool of hopelessness, there's been some very, very fact-based evidence about how this particular type of talent aggregation can take place. Since I've written my book, I've understood more deeply the difference between learned, inherited, environmental contributions to performance. I, I think, like all people, I underestimated the effects of the environment within which children are raised and how it affects their future performance. So things like confidence, curiosity, work habits, long-term thinking, socialization skills are mostly learned traits that are acquired by a combination of mimicking and exposure. There's this individual called David Brooks, who's a sociologist, who wrote a book that I really recommend that everybody reads called Social Animal. And he shows the low correlation between IQ and performance. In his book, he shows repeatedly in different circumstances how it's possible for children who have moderate IQ, who are given these things, confidence, curiosity, good work habits, long-term thinking, and good socialization skills, to outperform children with high IQ. If you listen to David Brooks' argument, it actually explains what's been happening in South Africa over the last 20 years, which is that despite all the barriers being taken away, and despite the fact that I believe, and I think everybody in this room believes, that talent is randomly distributed, it's still been proven time and time again that children from privileged backgrounds outperform children from not privileged backgrounds, which means since there's a big portion of privileged people that are white, there's a racial dynamic of that in South Africa that reinforces some old suspicions that we all have in the back of our heads that white people are smarter or better than black people. And I say that not to create uh, the impression that I believe that. And I think nobody in this room fundamentally believes that. But it's an important thing to understand what's functionally happening. And it's an important cycle to break because without breaking that cycle, we cannot hope to create the type of society that we think is colorblind. Now, it costs a lot of money to try and fix this education system. And I think that uh, several ANC governments have passed the buck and have made the argument that by creating the conditions where there's more water, more electricity, uh, more food in the current schooling environment, whilst tinkering with the syllabus, we are actually doing the best that we can with the resources that we can. And indeed, when you look at the spend that we've got on our education sector, I think that it's very difficult to argue that one should spend more from the national fiscals. Okay? But I think we need to count the costs as a society of the current system of inequity continuing. And I think we need to look no further than our neighbors, our friends in Zimbabwe, who are experiencing a different feature, which is an inability to have dealt with the troubles that have come from transition in a way that is equitable and fair, which has come to bite them close to 30 years after they've achieved that transition. 20 years in, we need to learn those lessons because I think that the arguments that people like Julius Malema are making become stronger and stronger the longer the system remains inequitable and the longer the system remains unfair. And I think it's only rational that people will begin to support that line of thinking if they think that there's no alternative strategy from a national point of view. And so I think that from uh, the point of view of understanding the benefits of embracing talent aggregation, 
we need to look no further than the pool of social trust and the social trust deficits that not investing in, in talent creates. So there's two sides of the equation. Can you afford to fix the education system in what you need to uh, uh, fundamentally change about teacher education in terms of how we uh, restructure the public school system in terms of the type of criteria that we've got for um, a minimum standard of teaching on a year-on-year -year basis, increasing pass rates, doing all of these different things. Can you afford the effects of that? And I think that's the one side of the equation. I'm not sure people look at the other side of the equation and say, can we afford not to do it? And my argument is that when you look at both sides of the equation, you're going to see there's a net saving of investing now in education to break the cycle. And these investments have to be massive. They can't be tinkering on the margins. Okay? There's a, a gentleman whose name is Stephen Covey, and he talks about the role of trust deficits and what they do to a society. Just pardon me for reading a long quote. But he says the unspoken rule about the giving of trust and the acquisition of other people's trust is that it is reliant on completely subjective observations, usually based on an inherent set of prejudices held by the party giving or denying this trust. This obvious and intuitive rule of thumb is nonetheless hugely critical to understanding the context around which institutions build individual or group trust banks based on a set of shared and prioritized prejudices. Now, a trust bank is built up when there are more deposits than there are withdrawals. Prejudices facilitate withdrawals. Familiarity and interpersonal confidence facilitate deposits. Repeated over time, these prejudices become institutionalized and can be manifested in many forms of filters geared to offer employment opportunities, promotions to a particular type of employee. That's an important social construct to understand because I think it explains and identifies precisely some of the problems that we're seeing in South Africa. So trust deficits in South Africa have three main manifestations. The first I'd call in-group preference. And that is, if we all went to UCT and we trust each other as quality graduates from a university that has delivered a particular level of education to us, we tend to only then hire graduates from UCT. So that is on the basis of not trusting the other institutions within society. And it has a particular type of inefficiency that it creates over a period of time. And it's important that when you add the racial element to this in-group preference, you then start to see how it's possible that after so many years, we've got so few executive directors at a JSC level. We've got so few um, kind of levels of genuine black leadership at the entrepreneurial level, people that are creating businesses that are running massive uh, industrial concerns. I think those numbers don't reflect what's been happening because of some of these trust deficits. Somebody needs to fund these people. Somebody needs to employ these people. Somebody needs to give procurement. Somebody needs to do favors, and that requires trust. And a society that has a low trust as a symptom of a bigger issue starts to manifest some of these inefficiencies that we are seeing in South Africa. And then the retort is, let's take that trust back. And that's been the beginning of what I'm hearing as a businessman that's working here in Joburg, that's working with government officials who are starting to think that the message is not coming through to white business, that there needs to be some sort of transfer, and so a taking needs to take place. And I think that that's symptomatic of these trust deficits that Covey talks about. The second issue is short-termism. And I think we see it in the context of the workplace, be it uh, some of the professionals, black professionals, that are hopping from job to job, who do that because they don't have a fundamental trust that that institution will reward them for long-term uh, kind of patronage of that particular institution. And what we need to fix in that context is the reward structure within corporate South Africa that needs to reflect a high trust environment within society. Because 
that then leads to a much more sustainable, much more orderly progression of executives up the value chain. And I think that works within the non-profit uh, world as well as the for-profit world. We'll see a lot of examples of people that are job hopping and moving from one uh, executive profession to another executive profession without the continuity that's required to build capacity within the individual as a person that can excel within that environment. The third issue, which I think we see a lot, I call institutional subversion, which could be called corruption. Okay? And part of that is just not having trust that the institution that you're working in or society in general will reward you for excellent performance over time. And so what you do is you reward yourself in the short term as a way of making sure that you line your pockets and you're not sure that this thing is going to happen in a five or 10 year or 15 year basis. If you look at many of the politicians around the world, there's a revolving door between government and business. That revolving door is just a little bit bigger and wider than what it is here. I think our revolving door is quite small. And we find our politician, whilst they're in power, looking to line their pockets, whilst they're in business, looking to angle for powerful positions. And I think the combination of the two creates a trust deficit that becomes insurmountable because it becomes more and more uh, the case that figures in power, which, let's be honest, are largely black, are associated with corruption. And that has a way of feeding itself as well as part of our trust deficits. So in my view, the inability to aggregate talent either rationally, fairly, or productively is at the heart of South Africa's underperformance. So we can call it a skills shortage, we can call it corruption, we can call it whatever we want to call it, but these are symptoms of a bigger problem, which is an inequity in which the way society has decided to allocate opportunities to different individuals. And I think that's what we need to fix to try and change people's focus, extend their lens, and make people function and act in a much more long-term manner. Now, I've had the experience, both in business, of seeing some of the interesting side effects that come from this. We, in my business, Spinnaker, are investing in a lot of entrepreneurial SMEs. Uh, these are businesses usually between 50 million to 150 million in value. And increasingly what we're seeing is SMEs are generating huge number of talented white entrepreneurs that have come out of business and have decided that there's no opportunity for them to excel. And so these guys are coming into entrepreneurship and they come with real skills. And their skills are being backed by capital. And even a person who considers themselves conscious like myself, I'm finding myself inundated with opportunities to back huge numbers of talented white entrepreneurs. And there's nothing I can do in terms of organizing society differently. I've just got to go with where the opportunities are. Now, what's happening on the other side is the public sector is chasing black skills. And they're discriminating on the basis of race. And so we've got this odd thing where private sector money is chasing white skills, public sector money is chasing black skills. And that's a huge disaggregation. And it creates a long-term unsustainable economy because you need a combination of both private and public funding in any business. If you look at all of the big ones, they've had a combination of both in order to succeed. That just gives you a kind of snapshot view of what are the subset issues that are created by this lack of trust. Okay? Now, it gets at the heart of the very type of integration that South Africa is trying to create. My father once said that true integration is predetermined by the ability of each one of us as individuals to attain what he called the envisioned self. What he meant, in my view, was that a precondition for genuine integration between society is self-actualization. And that journey of self-actualization comes from taking um, kind of a leap of faith and saying to yourself, if I perform to the very best of my abilities, society is going to propel me forward. Okay, so I'm not going to hold back on how much I work. I'm not going to hold back on uh, the things that I do in order to try and reach my long-term objective because I'm going to get a fair reward in society for those efforts. That's what I think needs to be reignited again in South Africa. I think we saw that 
when people like myself were at the University of Cape Town in 94, when people just decided to do things for the good of the long-term interests of the country. And to be expected, obviously, once the realities of some of the trade-offs that are needed came to dawn on us, I think people have gone back to some of the old habits of thinking much more short-term. And I think society has caught up with itself by the realities of this inequity and this lack of aggregation that I talk about affecting how each one of us participates. And so we find ourselves compromising every day. And I'm sure if you are honest with yourself, in small ways, you as an individual are compromising the ideals that you had in 1994. And some of these things are to be expected, but I think a lot of them can be fixed. If I look at what my proposal on how to fix some of this is, it's based on one philosophy. The philosophy is that true empowerment is about the attainment of educational opportunities, the attainment of job opportunities, and the attainment of wealth creation opportunities. Those are the three things that empowerment is based on. And the way we've chosen to legislate for black economic empowerment has presupposed that forever in a day, black people will need a handout. Okay? If you address the fundamental issue, which is black people and white people have different types of opportunities in this country based on geography, based on their parents, based on the support networks that they have around them. If we can fix that, and some of that is financial, some of that is attitudinal, and some of that is just long-term planning, if you can fix that, you do not need to have perpetual empowerment policies. So the question is how? And what I've proposed in my book is what I call a re-engineering South Africa fund, which is to take the amount of money we've got earmarked for BEE, which is 500 billion rands going forward. We've spent 500 billion rands already. We've got another 500 billion rands earmarked for BEE. For those firms, instead of giving money to people like myself and other entrepreneurs around the room to do things with that money and then trickle it down to the communities we come from, to actually use that money to address the fundamental issue, which is we need to fix three big things. We need to get charter schools up and running in the country. And whatever you want to call them, you want to call them contract schools, you want to call them independent schools. But we need to boost the number of independent schools from 5% to closer to 20% in order for us to have a hope of alleviating some of the strain from the public school system. Secondly, we need to fix the whole issue of teacher training and teacher standards that are set. You can't fix that without money because fundamentally in 1994, we found a way to fix getting rid of teachers that we thought at that time were not good for the economy and which was we paid them. We gave them a pension. And unfortunately, we gave the wrong people pensions. We kept the wrong people and so we ended up paying twice. Okay? And we've been paying ever since. And my view is that rather than paying in small drips and drabs, let's give the current backlog of bad teachers a check and pension them off in exchange for a new system that sets a minimum standard for qualified teachers to come in. Now, there are 200 and odd thousand teachers in the country. One of the big retorts are, where are you going to find 200,000 people? I believe people in this audience will go back and teach for a year or two whilst people get ready to take that mantle as a stopgap measure. And what we can't do is to take teachers that are given the curse of Bantu education, project them onto our kids today, and expect a different result. Okay? So financially, somebody has to cut a deal with Saktu that says, we acknowledge the fact that these teachers are in this situation not because of their own doing. But Firstly, everybody has to take a test for a minimum standard of uh, teaching to be uh, checked and attained in terms of qualifications. And those that fail that test have to be given some sort of pension. Okay? So that's one of the things that I propose in my book. The, the third thing I think, and, and, and each one of these blocks is huge complications, which I try and address some of them. But the third thing is we've got to fix our FET system. We've got an FET system that is dreamt up by ministers, 
who haven't worked in industry, haven't engaged corporate sector in terms of what types of skills the out, outgoing people that are qualifying from these FETs need to have. And more importantly, haven't engaged the manufacturing community about the type of equipment that they're using so that we can train people on the right type of equipment today. So one of the things that I propose is we take lessons learned from Singapore, from Finland, and from a country like Ireland, and we sit down with CEOs and ask, if you had to design a curriculum that would have as an output the type of employee that you would employ on the other side, what would it be? Right? Then you sit down with business and you say, we'll give you a tax exemption in exchange, and this is kind of bringing in the depreciation of their manufacturing um, equipment in exchange for you giving that manufacturing equipment into the FET community so we can use what you're using now. Right? Then you say, can you give two or three of your most kind of uh, technically competent people for a national tour of duty to come and teach at these FETs for two years? That's what's happened and that's how Singapore has gotten where they are. That's how Ireland got where they are. And some of these things are available to us as lessons learned, but we have to implement them by wanting to actually achieve the end, which is to produce a quality FET graduate. Okay. And so these are three of hundreds of proposals that I make in the book in terms of ways that we think, or I think I can help unlock some of the bottlenecks that are there. The fundamental premise is that the great African society will not be created by government, will not be created by business. It will be created by citizens of this country feeling empowered to achieve some of the things that they feel within their capacity that they're here to, to put on the table. And that talent that these people have needs to be unlocked by removing the barriers and by creating a more meritocratic way of organizing uh, skills in the country. And uh, I hope that you guys read the book and I hope that you guys share in that vision because I think that uh, the inability to do that is going to lead to some very, very scary prospects going forward. Thank you. take some questions, uh, but before we do that, a uh, small request. Um, he's here as Shumelo Biko, uh, the author uh, of the book, and not uh, the son of Mampel Rampel, <laughs> of Akhang. <laughs> so let's make the distinction uh, between him and Akhang, and he's not here to speak about Akhang. So let's uh, ask relevant questions. Uh, uh, so that's the small request. Questions? Comments? Not necessarily questions, but comments. Thanks. Um, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Other than, and we're not going to go on to the issue of, is anybody listening? That's the problem. Yeah. Is anybody listening? I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful and it's a dream and you can see the vision, but you've got to have people listening. Sure. I think that uh, the difficulty is to talk about problems without bringing forward solutions. And I uh, have tried in this book to be balanced in terms of criticizing our elders who both white and black contributed to the situation the way it is today and to try and suggest ways in which we can work with some of the current government plans to take the country forward. Um, just about 10,000 people have bought the book, which in South African terms is excellent. Um, and all of those people are people who are like-minded, so people in this room who think quite similarly in terms of uh, trying to find problems uh, out of some of the challenges we've got. I think the difficulty is in reaching bigger numbers in terms of people who may not necessarily be um, kind of quick to go and read books of this type. And that particular audience is the one that's been swayed by the debate at the moment about nationalization. And so I think that uh, forums like this in different contexts is to try and 
actually engage with people who come from uh, opposite school of thought in terms of how to fix the problems and through that to try and then uh, encourage people to read an alternative view. So I'm trying my best. Okay. Um, Lebu, stand up. This is Lebu. Um, she's responsible for us being here tonight. She wants to collect business cards and she's going to do a draw and the winning card will get a book. Okay. So she's going to pass around this thing. I thought they'd give you a better prize, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm, okay. I'm going to go that side after this second hand. So get a hand ready that side. Mr. Biko, thank you for the speech. You proposed a number of solutions at the end there, and a lot of them, well, all of them involved some sort of governmental intervention. Mm. And do you, or have you considered solutions or proposals that don't involve the government? And the context of the question is that mm. I think all of us can come up with a number of ideals mm. if we could just simply click our fingers and change the way that our government behaves. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that that's never realistically going to be going sure. to happen. And going down to the individual level, mm -hmm. the question, how do I contribute? What do I do? What do you do as the individual? That's right. Uh, is a little bit more challenging because you've got the drop in the ocean effect. Sure. How do you make that impact? Sure. I'm a big proponent of two of the things that you're speaking about. One is using incentive, incentive structures to try and make changes in society. And those incentive structures work in, with private sector uh, within the private sector environment and within the public sector environment. So you have two different types of incentive structures. In this book, I've tried to talk about the things that private sector can do independently of government. The ethos of using this money, this empowerment money, is to actually try and challenge private sector to use funds that they have earmarked to change the society and redirect those funds by not pushing them through investment holding companies and requiring them to be taxed and then filtering them down into the communities by saying, why don't you directly invest in those communities, right? So at the moment, there's plenty of examples of people that are doing this, and I use Alan Gray as one example. There's no reason why all companies in the JSC aren't doing it, right? And part of this book is to try and challenge executives to say, have you thought differently around the way that you can empower people in society, right? To go down to the individual, I think that uh, I am a huge proponent of crowdfunding, right? And we've got a school that we've started uh, called African Schools for Excellence. And our first one is in Sakani. It starts grade seven, goes to grade 12. And we are encouraging crowdfunding as a way to pay for tuition for uh, individual students there. So we've actually got 100% of our tuition paid for by this crowdfunding. And so as I try and encourage the quote unquote asset class of charter schools, I'm actually trying to do that. We, we're going to try and do 200 of these schools, which are low fee, low cost uh, private schools in poor communities, and to try and use uh, these type of forum to draw attention to this thing and then say, go and look at the website, see whether or not you want to support it. And I'm one of uh, many South Africans doing this on their individual kind of uh, basis. There's five billion worth of social enterprise money that's actually going from not from big companies, but from individuals like me and you, every year into stuff like this. So it's happening. It's a question of joining that movement, not starting it, because it's out there. Yeah. All right, let's have a hand that side. Um, <clears throat> I wish to talk about, you talk about um, assets, you know, creation and so on. But you don't look at poverty, you know, Gustav Guterres, the liberation theologian of South, uh, of South America, mm -hmm. talks about three instances of poverty. Mm -hmm. The first instance of poverty is it's basically materialism. Mm -hmm. The second, it's a spiritual poverty. Mm -hmm. The third, you, con you, you talked about it in your opening... Um, uh, speech is poverty as a commitment. Mm. <clears throat> now, how would you bridge this mm. paradigm? Mm. Because it is significant, the Gini coefficient in South, 
it's the largest in the world. Mm. How are you going to come up with a responsible solution? Sure. Thank you for the question. I think two things. One is that in my book, I, I show that not only is the Gini coefficient in South Africa remained largely unchanged or widened, but the so-called teal index, which is in-group inequality, has widened tremendously. And the dangers of that is the type of uh, spiritual poverty that you talk about, which spirals when people become consumed with consumption. And that's happening a lot with black people in this country as we all start to be able to acquire some of the trappings of wealth that we've aspired towards, we are leaving people behind in thought, mind, and deed, okay? And so part of what I'm suggesting is to use a trial and tested kind of Jesuit way of focusing on education as an enabler, so teaching people how to fish as opposed to giving them fish, which is what we're doing with regards to our grant policies. And I think my whole book is based on Gustav and what he's trying to do. Uh, and, and I'm just espousing some of the uh, uh, pieces of advice that people like him and other Jesuit priests have given to uh, us as, as ways of creating genuine empowerment. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'll stand because I like to see the person I'm speaking to counter what my Bantu educated mothers taught me, never look at the person in the eye. Um, I have um, two concerns and one comes from um, what the Vice Chancellor said. He said that at UCT, the fees are high and therefore keeps um, the student-teacher, well, lecture ratio um, standard. Um, I actually find that problematic in that when you live in a country like South Africa, you actually can't look at ratios like that because you need to have the students get there. You need to, you, you almost have to set the bar to the level at which you are able to absorb as many competent students as possible. Not because you want to maintain a ratio of, oh, if I only have 10 students in the class and they pay um, 100,000 a year, therefore I can manage and um, I can manage to pay the bills and I can offer them better education. So I actually had a problem with that. Mm. And another problem that I had with something that you said, um, Mr. Vigo, I'm a bit shaky. <laughs> it's okay. But it's fine. You don't buy it, I promise. It's always so different and you have to speak and you like seeing so many people. You said that 80% of our schools, public schools, are in disarray. I'm just putting, um, using, putting my own words to You'll have to tell me um, on what basis you're saying that. Um, are you looking at, which schools are you looking at or what are you comparing them to? Okay and what factors you use to determine that, because that's a huge number. Sure. And coming from a public school myself, and yeah. having gone to public schools, yeah. and having seen how a lot of learners come out yeah. and perform well, I'm yeah. actually very concerned that you would actually come and say something like that. Sure. So I'd like for you to substantiate that. Sure. Um, that's now number three. Huh? Yeah, yeah, this is the last <laughs> one, don't worry. <laughs> this is the last one. Um, you, on, on one of the solutions that you proposed, yeah. um, I, I must say that I admire that you, you raise the questions and the problems that we're facing as a country, and you also propose solutions. I think it's a very good thing. Now, but I do have a question on when you said that um, Bantu education teachers should be given a check and go home. Um, what do you say to the child whose mother is Bantu educated because the child is still going to go home. Because some of the factors that you identified mm -hmm. as a challenge is that um, a parent uh, or a child who's taught to be able to work properly, um, mm. to follow a certain way and, mm. you know, almost like culturally. Mm. So if my mother taught me good, good, a goodest, What's the, what, how is it going to help if you fire the teacher mm -hmm. and employ someone from here who's a UCT graduate mm -hmm. and I still go back to my mother who's still going to help me to read mm -hmm. and is going to tell me my child is mm -hmm. good, gooder, goodest. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly how she did, okay. said it to me. So yeah, that's sure. all. I, I'd like to have an opportunity of dealing with the question and then I'll give Max a chance right at okay. the end. Okay. Uh, I learned lots of things from my son. He tells me all the time, uh, no, Dad, it's not like this, it's like that. And I think that fundamentally we have to trust that children have capacities that go beyond what their parents have. And children have opportunities that go beyond what their parents have. That's what parenting is about, is to try and facilitate that outcome. 
And so if we stay trapped by the fact that we've got to teach the child according to what the parents are, I think we are fundamentally selling ourselves short as black people firstly and as a country second. Okay? Uh, going back to the issue of the standards, and I think Max made a good point about ratios because ratios in education are important. We run a school on the same basis that all private schools are run in this country, which is that we try and keep a student-teacher ratio of 20 to 1. Okay? We found an innovative way of doing that without increasing fees. And the way we do that is to actually break the class time into three. So 60 minutes get split into two, three chunks of 20 minutes. First 20 minutes, the teacher teaches a class of 20. And let's say they teach algebra. The next 20 minutes, they're in a room using a program called Khan Academy, which is a free math program, where the students are actually going through the problems raised by the lesson that they've just gotten, right? There's a teacher's assistant that's walking around in the room who's a much lower cost resource, and the teacher that was teaching these 20 kids is teaching another 20 at that time. The last part of the cycle is that these kids are then organized in terms of who got the highest marks, so who got the furthest in the program, because the program won't let you go from one problem to the next without solving it. So the teacher's assistant can see somebody got to problem number eight, somebody's stuck at two, and puts the class in those two categories, and then uses people that went and solved problem number seven to start with the guys that ended at problem number two. And they put them together in peer learning program. We found that that is drastically increasing the results because you're getting three types of learning. One is teacher instruction, which is important. The second is actual dealing with the uh, problems in a practical way by problem solving directly yourself without any assistance. And then the third is peer learning. And I think that there's something in that model that we're creating that can be used and replicated in different institutions. And we're backing an entrepreneur that's actually come up with this as part of a dissertation that they did in the US and has decided that they want to implement it in South Africa. And we're seeing some amazing results. So just to give you a tip on, on ratios and how I think ratios can work. I've forgotten your third comment, but I'm going to let Max just answer for himself. Oh, OK. That stat is actually an unchallengeable stat, because if you look at the criteria set by the minister in terms of what the basic amounts of infrastructure need to be in the country for a school to count as adequate, the ministers decided to buck the trend and actually not come up with standards at all. So what's happened is that NGOs have gone and done their own audits on what's happening in the school environments, and they've taken some basic minimum criteria. And they've come up with a ratio of 80% when they look at the school infrastructure, when they look at the uh, ratio of uh, students to teachers, when they look at things that you wouldn't even believe the number of, of schools with uh, no windows, uh, the number of learners with no desks. All of those different types of things have been taken into account and they've come up with that figure. I've quoted that figure from these NGOs and have, I haven't been challenged and I've been in some pretty hostile uh, audiences. <laughs> and, <laughs> and my view is that that is actually a generous figure. If you look at the pass rates, uh, and not the 33% pass rates, but the actual pass rates, if you look at 50% as a criteria, the number of students that pass that are shockingly low. And you work your way backwards and you do your calculation of what, what is functional and what's dysfunctional. Uh, thanks, Lungida. That, thank you so much for answer, asking that question, the one directed to me, because um, uh, in my haste to... Uh, give Flamela his time, I didn't uh, unpack that uh, as I should have. And it's an excellent question. Um, you know, we're very, in some ways we're very lucky that the government allows us to set our own fees in South Africa. And that's why the fees at different universities are different. But there is a quid pro quo. And that is that you have to ensure that the fees do not prevent people from getting in. Fees can't become an, a barrier to access. And so um, we have uh, been able to create a financial aid scheme 
which uh, ensures, and you may, some of you may have seen it, we happen to be advertising it and marketing it in this two-week period again because we're getting up to the uh, students have to apply before the end of September and we want to ensure students know that any student that we accept on academic grounds uh, and who, is, who merits financial aid will get the financial aid from UCT. And the principle is this, if you just think about it, let's imagine that um, the fee was 100 and uh, everyone could afford 100 and you decided to double the fee to 200 but only 50% could afford 200 uh, then what we would do is we would in fact create a bursary for 50% of the students equivalent of 100 so we would charge around 200 but then we would give 50 of them 50% of them the 100 fee so they only pay the old fee of 100 you're still left with 50% with, with of the students paying the extra 100 yeah. so as long as there is a significant number of students who can afford the higher fee, it, it's worth your while to raise the fee, but to generate a financial aid system that waives the fee for the other students. So at, at the University of Cape Town, about half of our students are middle class uh, and can afford higher fees. In fact, many of them are coming out of private schools where they were paying much higher fees mm. than we charge them at the university, as mm. it turns out. Um, and so uh, we think that it's not unreasonable to create that sort of cross-subsidization system within the university. It shouldn't be our job to do that. It should be a government job to redistribute income and revenue and to do that through the tax system, but they're not doing that uh, sufficiently. So in a sense, we take on that task, and those high fees are matched by financial aid schemes that will cover everything. So and to give you a sense of the generosity of it, uh, the, the, of course, some of this is supported by the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, NISFAS. But NISFAS, only, you're only eligible for NISFAS funding up to a household income of 230000 mm. per year. Um, and it's a little bit more if you have several children and they're at school and at university, so obviously your costs are higher. But mm. it, just to simplify it, let's say you had one child and you had a family income of 230000 or less, then you would be eligible for NISFAS funding. But we find that many households between 230,000 and up to 500,000 also find the fees uh, too much of a strain because they are quite high. And so we have a financial aid scheme which will cover students all of the way up to uh, 500,000 family income. Mm. Anyone below that is entitled to uh, a form of financial aid. It's combinations of loans and bursaries. So that, and, and up to now we have been able to honor that. Now part of it comes from the high fees, but part of it comes from alumni, and a lot of alumni support bursaries. Part of it comes from foundations, mm. uh, like uh, you know, in charities, international foundations and charities. Some of it comes from the corporate sector, uh, particularly groups like uh, SAICA, the, um, which is the Tutuka program for accountants, uh, engineering companies, mm. mining companies, uh, companies particularly where they're going to employ people afterwards. And then part of it comes from our own budget, uh, which we allocate. So of the Total, um, we, we have a financial, of the, we get this, from this first we get 112 million, about 100 million. We put in 100 million of our own money. We raise about 100 million from foundations and donors, and we raise 100 million from corporates. So our financial aid scheme is roughly 400 million a year. And it's only because we are doing that and can do that that we are able to actually sustain the higher fees without creating a barrier to access. <laughs> And I know that other universities, I'm not saying it's a solution for the country because I know not everyone would be able to do that, mm. um, but that's uh, one of the ways in which we've tried to ensure that we sustain the excellence. So thanks for giving me a chance to answer that. It's a really important question. Yep. All right. Uh, I'm going to do two questions this side and two questions that side. All right. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for, you know, such progressive thinking and all that. Um, it's very encouraging to find that there's people that are thinking about the future of South Africa and, you know, seeing, sort of trying to find ways of how we can move forward. Mm -hmm. I am a little bit concerned, though, because as a parent, mm -hmm. already I am paying tax mm -hmm. as an employee, mm -hmm. and it's a very huge tax that I pay to the government, but unfortunately, I feel that it's being abused because it's not being put into proper use. Secondly, in order to give my children a good opportunity in life, I have to send them to very expensive schools. Yeah. And, you know, to sort of think of ways that I can make a difference is very difficult because I think to myself, already I'm paying a huge tax, I'm paying expensive school fees, what difference can I make? So I'm, you know, basically thinking to myself, 
something has to change up there, something needs to change in the way that things are being done. I don't feel empowered to provide the solution, mm. you know, and donate to build better schools because I don't have the money. I pay the tax and I pay the fees and I'm done. Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. My husband and I will be buying your book. Hopefully there's an answer there. But is there anything that you can say to people like me? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think... The harsh reality is that, you know, we've said today we're not going to talk about politics, but unfortunately that is where the solution is, right? And so all of us have um, got limits to what we can do and what we then have to fall back on is our ability as citizens to choose our leaders. And unfortunately, uh, I think we have failed to uh, take our citizenship outside of our homes and try and make it our business to actually engage our community in terms of their vote and the quality of their vote and what they're using their vote for. Um, you know, obviously you guys are very sophisticated and you can make these arguments, but when you go back to the people that are receiving grants and that are asking the fundamental question, if I'm in the queue waiting for a house or I'm next in line, I'm about to get my electricity switched on, if I don't vote for the NC, will I not get that decision, right? And so, unless we break that cycle, and I am a huge uh, fan of what the NC has done, and I think the NC would be much better as a party if it embraces competition, because then the good people inside the party can use the competition as a way of getting the bad people out the party. That's what happens with all entities that we're involved in. If Max didn't have competition, I don't think UCT would look the way it looks, okay? And I think that the competitive landscape of our South African politics is not a theoretical exercise. It's that last barrier to getting the type of society that we want. And I think we've all got to do our bit to advocate for that change. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Lumelo. My name is Uzuki. I think my question has to do with, I kind of, obviously you're an idealist. You believe yes. in the good of the world, yes. the good of society. We yes. are people driven by amazing ideals. We're not self-serving yeah. the lot. I used to buy into that when I was a student. <laughs> now I'm in corporate, now I'm in the public sector. I'm not sure if I still hold on to those types of values anymore. Sure. And I think my question, I've got two questions for you, right? Yeah. The first question is about technological advancement, right? Mm. To what extent, like you speak of firing teachers because they have a bunch of education. I don't think that speaks to the current reality. I think it's quite a serious wish list. You can't just fire people. You've got trade unions that are quite active and an ANC that's quite protective of its working class. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to be more innovative and pragmatic mm -hmm. in terms of how we provide solutions for a changing South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, technology, like your iPads, your mm. iPhones, your mm. social networks, mm. we haven't done enough at looking at the different ways mm. in which we can teach different types of people mm. and, and hence contributing towards transforming higher education. Our paradigms mm. are still the paradigms of old. Yeah. We still continue to hold on to the paradigms that our, our, our parents hold on to. Yeah. And, and the reality is that students, learners, young people will learn if things are exciting. Mm. So. The question is bigger, and it's, it's bigger, it's, more, it's not just about do we have the right teachers, but it's about the culture mm. of the learning environment. Mm. How do you teach, what do you teach, and mm. how do you captivate the imaginations of the day and of the time? Mm. So I think for me, it's a challenge to you, sure. in essence. Go beyond the old paradigms, the yep. re generation that's actually mandated to think beyond. Mm -hmm. So don't look at pointing out the obvious, because well, I think a lot of us have thought of that, and it's not in a silly reality in terms of our day and point in time. Okay, can I, can I give you a statistic that your iPad can't even do this calculation? That's how big it is. Okay. $220 billion is our education spend roughly, right, going next year. I don't know what the number is, right, but it's roughly around there. 70% of that is going to pay teachers. So you look at her point, where are we spending our money, right? The quality of our education system is dependent on the quality of our teachers. That's an inextricable fact. And you're trying to go around that by saying, let's give them more uh, technology. I agree with you. Technology can help. But technology is an enabler. It's a tool, right? I didn't say that a bunch of education teachers should be fired. I said every single teacher should be tested. If you go and you buy a product of any kind, even a pen, South African Bureau of Standards have tested this pen. 
or an equivalent pen and have made sure that this thing is functional. Why is it so difficult for us to do that with our teachers, right? And you talk about Saktu, these are maybe 220,000 people in a country of 50 million people. You mean to tell me that it doesn't make political sense for somebody to put this issue at the front end and argue that parents should actually support them? I think it's a very pragmatic thing to say, let's change our teachers. I think it's actually the most cutting edge thing we can do because once we have found a minimum quality of education that we all accept as public school education that all of our kids can go to, a lot of our problems are going to reveal themselves to be actually quite superficial, right? And my view is that as black people, we've got the biggest skin in this game. And we can't allow our older generation people to keep putting the barriers of Saktu and these things in front of us. It's our money. We're the biggest voters in the country. We've got to make our voices heard. Yeah, I think my argument, to be honest, I think so, so change the teachers, who's going to teach? Am I supposed to leave my comfy, comfy you know, high life, La Vide, in Santa and working for like a high shot mm. management consulting firm to go work for, to go to, go to Transkai, to mm. go to any lady, mm -hmm. to actually work as a teacher, mm -hmm. earning hardly a salary? Mm -hmm. I mean, the bigger issue is that I think we, we need to consider when, when, sure. when speaking of higher education transformation. It's fun. We can and, argue uh, this all day, but just this, the secondary point, if you look at how much you're making, and let's say you and your husband earn together, okay? A big chunk of your income is gonna to go towards private school education. My kid is going to grade R costing 62,000, right? If we all opt out of the public school system, it's gonna cost us more money than teaching for one year. I'd far rather teach for one year and pay for public school education than to spend my life working for private school education for my kid, which is what our future is destined to do. So I think you have to consider both sides of that argument. All right, we'll take two hands this side. <coughs> Hi, my name is Namfunda. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by a couple of things you mentioned. Uh, but the, the, first of all, our, um, we've got 600,000 unemployed graduates, mm. the majority of whom are black, mm. which we know. So we've got a private sector that doesn't absorb all these black kids with all these degrees and certificates and, 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 and. And that's an issue. You cannot, so we can't just say these, these kids aren't educated. Yeah. Or if we're saying they are not educated, why are we allowing these institutions to yeah. churn out these kids? Yeah. So some of these kids are coming from UCT, yeah. UPE, and yeah. all of that. Why are we allowing... <laughs> these institutions to churn out students that cannot be absorbed by the market, That's right. what, what. Yeah. And then secondly, this issue of meritocracy, I, I, it had my back up, but I, I won't get there. <laughs> it's politics between you and I okay. in terms of ideology. Okay. But it, in a society that, doesn't, that hasn't even agreed on what its basic values are, yeah. what is merit? Who determines what it is? Yeah. Who decides what that is? You know, and it, in a lot of cases, I've found that merit is, is, is determined by very old school mm. um, values. So it's, mm. you know, old boys that went to all grade together mm. that speak in a particular way mm. and, and society or in a, in a mm. country like ours mm. that's very racially based, mm. the kind of person that speaks a particular way mm. that went to a particular school mm. and, 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 and that... Sure. You know? So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that when we talk about merit, we are excluding a large group of people sure. because that merit is determined by a very few minority mm. who are very influential in terms of mm. finance, economy, and what what. Sure. Thank you for the question. Right. So, I sorry, could I just ask for 10 more minutes so that I can cover a little bit more uh, questions? Uh, just give me 10 more minutes. I know my regulars are going to start panicking. Mm. We don't usually have this long a question and answer session. Sure. 10 more minutes. Okay. I think it's a great question. And um, fundamental to the question is how you look at the definition of merit. Right? If you talk about where it is that our values are written as a society, our values are written in our constitution. And we wrote that together. That started... That process started in the 1920s when black people started talking about what the constitution for South Africa should look like. 
which is a lot of that stuff has come into the current constitution. So it's, it's a very representative document that represents our hopes and dreams and our values. The word that you see there all the time is equality. It's equality of opportunity is a fundamental tenant of the things that we as South Africans have agreed to do as an, an, an agreed to espouse. And it's the one particular right <clears throat> that we are throwing dust on every day. And so when I talk about merit, it's the ability for a child in Guguletu to have the same prospects of getting into UCT as a child in Sandhurst on the basis purely of their abilities, right? That's very idealistic, and I completely agree with you. But that's where we should hope to get to and then settle for something else. We can't settle in our hopes. Otherwise, we're selling our children short. Okay? And <clears throat> when it comes to how I, as a black person, look at the word merit, I've actually written a chapter for a book coming out uh, in uh, Tolela Mangu's book on race relations in South Africa amongst the youth. And I wrote about race relations in the workplace. And the argument that I make is that we have to have a two-sided bargain. On the one side, we have to say to black kids, do the best you can, get the best grades you can. And on the other side, we will give you the opportunities. Right? A lot of the people coming from even UCT, some of us, we graduate from UCT and you don't have good enough marks. And you can't be employed because other people have better marks. Right? That doesn't mean that you're a wasted uh, graduate. It just means that the system couldn't absorb you. And part of that has to do with the fact that we're not growing as fast as we should be. So there's a select pool of people that have been employed in the first place. But some of it is, has to do a lot with the type of qualifications that we're getting. And this is a secondary issue. We'll talk about it another time. But we have to get uh, career guidance early enough so that our black kids are learning quicker the types of education uh, to get if you want to get jobs. And I think a lot of us don't have that support, and that's part of the problem. Sorry, sorry. can I just ask this? Uh, Shomela is going to stay after the session. <laughs> so all follow-up questions can follow up then. Yeah. Uh, we've got quite a few people to cover. Thanks. Hi, um, I suppose I come from an uh, older generation yes. when uh, we use the word egalitarian. That's right. Uh, and perhaps the critique could be of your, of your position that it is uh, elitist mm -hmm. in the way that you've uh, they've put your position. But I find it refreshing that you are thinking differently mm -hmm. from perhaps a tradition of my kind, which perhaps is, I share with Max, perhaps, as you mm -hmm. call him, an unreconstructed communist. <laughs> um, but I wanted to make four points. <laughs> The one is I can't understand the link between what is a dysfunctional school system yeah. and your, your sort of ideological view that we need to reward an elite progressively. You know, because I think we all agree that the school system is dysfunctional, the education system is dysfunctional. There is no relation to whether we should have had a more reward-based system in the way that we built South Africa since, since 1990. So I can't understand that link. Um, the, the, the issue for me is the school system is not being fixed. Mm. And, and you've, you, you spoke to the stats. Mm. Um, we have a wealth of educationalists and, and education departments at all the universities, including, yeah. including UCT, yeah. that has done a hell of a lot of research around it. So it's, 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 for me, the, it's, it's an issue of a political problem. The second question I wanted to raise with you is mm. you don't refer to the NDP mm -hmm. at all in terms of the education prescripts. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's something that I wanted to ask sure. you about. Because I, remember, South Africa has done a lot of thinking about That's it. Right. Different views That's right. in terms of the consensus, with, even within the ANC, That's right. around the ANC. So That's right. I find it interesting that you're not engaged a whole tradition of education analysis That's right. that has looked at some of that stuff. So I, 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 you know, we, can, we mm. can talk about it afterwards. The third point is, <laughs> um, I also find it strange that you jump to specific solutions. Mm -hmm like either firing all the teachers or getting them all tested. Mm -hmm. Whereas you're, you're sharply aware of the fact that we live in a political context. Mm -hmm. So it's the social forces that drive why we are here now, mm -hmm. 20 years later, as opposed to 
the stuff that you spoke about in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And you don't refer to the fact that there's been a trajectory of why we are here now. Mm. Whereas I think in the book, the, the bits that I've read as I'm sitting here, mm. I think you, you, you talk about that. Mm. So I find it quite a sharp way that you jump to specific mm. uh, provisions mm. and not engaging the NDP's chapter on education mm. and not engaging many educationalists in, in South Africa mm. who, who, who said a lot about it. Sure. My last question is, are you a socialist or a capitalist? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for the four questions. I'll try and remember them, and I think Max raised his hand trying to, to chime in on one point. But I'll start with a simple answer to your question. I'm a South African, and I'm for whatever system is going to get South Africa out of the situation that we're in now. Somebody can present a viable uh, third way alternative between communism and, social, and capitalism. I'll be very happy with that. So you are okay, just hang on for a second. Oh. Yeah, that's right. So I don't see there's a dichotomy between doing good and doing well. And in my business, if you look at the things I'm invested in, if you look at the things that I do personally, I reject the need to make a choice between the two. That's just how I conduct myself personally. I can't tell other people what to do <clears throat> with their capital and with their opportunities. So I think that's a discussion for another day. I refer to the NDP all the time in my book. And in fact, I look at the presidency as part of the solution. And the problem now is we just don't have time to get into the depth of some of the drivers of some of these huge problems that we talked about today. So that's why I elected to write first as opposed to speak, so that I can always go back and refer to the things that I've written. And so I think if you engage the book, you'll see that I'm pretty aware of some of the societal and socioeconomic drivers of some of these problems. And I frame them in, co in a context which I believe will be advantageous to politicians making decisions today so that they can use some of these uh, choices. And these choices are no means things that I've thought about. I'm just aggregating what's out there in terms of best practice and have suggested some of these things as solutions. OK? OK. Um, I'm not sure if you can note. I'm going to take all those questions now, <coughs> the remaining questions. Uh, there's a gentleman there, this gentleman, and that gentleman. Uh, we have to close. Yeah. You know, he's had his hand up, uh, and he has said in that one. Um, uh, okay, can we take all these questions, and then you can answer them all. Sir. Um, Mr. Speaker, thanks for addressing us. Uh, just, uh, just for my failure to see the sense of urgency really um, and to, 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 to see how you're going to change the system. Mm. Um, I think the marriage between the, uh, the private and the public sector, as you said, is too, is too tight. So this is sort of a problem that I think they don't mind having on their hands. Mm. So it's, there's not necessarily a lot of urgency. I don't see, I don't know if you could see, um, sort of just explain to us you know, if, there, if there is a sense of urgency there. Okay. All right, second question. Thank you, uh, Shumelo. I'm as well, I'm And go but, um, but what I wanted to, to, to say is that your argument is very plausible, but the biggest thing is that we've got very hungry South Africans, <laughs> and, and we've got elections coming next year, mm -hmm. we've got all sorts of things going on. They want, they want food yesterday. Mm -hmm. We saw what happened in Cape Town. That's right. And private sector has been given this opportunity, you, you're talking about, about starting charter schools and all sorts of things through various policies that they could have followed, but they never followed them. And uh, we had this, this, this debate with my small group of partners in our small startup business trying to start, that it would be better off to create a meritocracy in South Africa is that everyone must have nothing. Mm -hmm. And we all start from scratch. Mm -hmm. We destroy Santin, everyone, Hyde Park. We <laughs> all go back to a very plain island. Yeah. And then we start a meritocracy from then. Sure. That's how we'll be able to recover. Yeah. Sure. Because we all want food yesterday. Yeah. And you want to create a meritocracy. So let's create it sure. in the best way possible. Just everyone must have nothing. We must start from scratch. Okay. Last question. Sir. Um, Tabi Soha, 
Mr. Biko, thank you for a very enlightening talk. Because I, I like hearing solutions because we all know the problems. So it's refreshing to be hearing solutions. Um, what I'm concerned about is that we, in my generations and the generations to come, we're creating a society where we're telling the youth, go to varsity, study, go into corporate. And what about, well, I mean, we live in a country that needs more employers than employees. Mm. What is being done, what can be done to create a society that actually turns out entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and not employees? Because mm -hmm. then what happens is that you end up like me, I'm 26, I'm stuck, I'm stuck in corporate, mm -hmm. I'm a budding entrepreneur, I want to start my own business, but I've got a bond, I've got a car, I've got a credit card, <laughs> I've got a lifestyle, yeah. you know? And then for me to just leave all of that is very hard. As yeah. great as I think my ideas are, as great as I think I would do as an entrepreneur, um, it just, I'm just, I don't want to say I'm blaming it, but when looking back, it's just the society I've been brought up in because they said, go to varsity, get your degree, get into corporate. So I'm like, I guess that's why they call it a rat race. I'm just, yep. anyway, my question is, <laughs> What can be done to change that cycle? Because I believe we need, like I said, we need more employers than employees. Okay. Are we sure. going to <coughs> just go with those three? Okay. I think the first point about the sense of urgency um, and what's driving uh, public and private sector to try and figure out some of these problems. I think the long-winded answer is that it ebbs and flows and it comes urgency comes and goes depending on what's happening. Right? I'll just tell you what's happening now. For the first time, I hear everywhere I go in the investment community, people are saying there's opportunities outside South Africa in Africa much more than here. And since the World Cup, we've been reaping this dividends of kind of the one society in the African continent that represents the platform for investing in the rest of Africa. I think that story is dying down. And I think that uh, countries like Kenya, countries like Mozambique, Zimbabwe will be fixed quicker than us, by the way, because they've got human capital, which we don't. And we're training the human capital to go back. And I think that that's a great thing from a geographic point of view, but it's a challenging thing from a South African point of view. So I think that's one issue. The second issue is, for the first time, I think people are starting to make a risk-adjusted view on South Africa, and that's represented in our currency. Okay. So corporates at the JSC are actually losing more value than I'm asking them to invest in this program of re-engineering South Africa. And that's because people are taking the view that if South Africa is not serious about fixing its long-term problems, I'm not going to be a long-term investor in the country. And so we're struggling to attract FDI. And that's showing up in terms of our GDP growth. And I think that there is the second question which is the youth of South Africa are saying, whilst all of that is happening, we don't want to wait. We want to actually start to assert ourselves politically and assert ourselves physically. And I think crime has been a leading indicator of that particular attitude, which is we're just going to take if we can. And I don't blame anybody that does it because the circumstances we're asking people to put up with are not livable. Okay, so if you have children and if you've got uh, a family to feed, the trade-offs are stay at home, be hungry, go out there and put yourself in a position where you are likely to have no employment or go and take. All Julius has done is taken that attitude and has elevated it and underpinned it with an argument, which is that the past has been what it is. It's time for us to actually redivide South Africa in a different way. There is a challenge to those people that come with the burn it down view. And I've got a chapter here called Societies in Peril, where I look at different societies and I show how their failure to deal with transformation, their failure to deal with the, whatever it was, the mechanism that liberated them as a country, and the economic uh, drivers that need to come and follow that political liberation. The failure to do that has led to some of these societies going down the path of peril. And I look at Venezuela as a very, very good example of a country that has embraced some of these tactics and said, let's just take our oil resources back, let's flood the welfare system and equalize by taking from the rich and giving to the poor. 
It's great on paper, <clears throat> great from a theoretical point of view, but been proven, and I'll give you 20 case studies in every single country, it leads to a worse situation for poor people. It leads to higher inflation, it leads to bread prices which are higher, right? And fundamentally, it always ends up being led by elites. And so the same people that are arguing on the basis of a populist argument end up backing elites to find some sort of way to get them out of poverty. And these elites desert them at the end by becoming corrupt and doing all of these things that me and you have seen in many of these countries. And I don't think the people currently espousing populist policies in South Africa are any different. Right? And so I challenge the uh, thought that if we burn down Santon, we somehow fix the problem by making everybody poorer. What will end up happening is 10 years from now, foreign people are going to come here, help build Santon again, and own Santon. Right? And you and I own Santon because it's owned by the Government Employees Pension Fund. It's owned by some of these old mutual pension funds, which we are beneficiaries of. What we need to do is to change the way that money gets spent in the economy. And that's a subject for another day, but I think that's fundamentally what we need to do as opposed to try and burn it down. So the third one, I think, it's this issue of work versus entrepreneurship. And I've had this battle myself, um, and I lost early because I just decided that I was not an employable character. <laughs> but I had to make a huge sacrifice. I can't have it both ways. So you can't have the nice car and the luxury and all that stuff and then still hope to be an entrepreneur. I knew what I wanted to do today, so I found somebody doing it, and I went to them, and I said, I'll work for you for nothing. And I hung around that guy long enough that he eventually started paying me something. But that old apprenticeship type model needs to be brought back to create the entrepreneurs of tomorrow. Because it's only through seeing that you can do. It's not about reading. I think you can read so much and you can get kind of the view of what it is that you're supposed to do uh, in any field. But you have to watch somebody do it and listen to some of their challenges that you can actually appreciate it. And so I think we actually need to push people to go for longer stints as apprentices who have to take some sort of compromise by earning less in exchange for the entrepreneurial path of tomorrow. And at the moment, as young black people, we want it both ways. We want the high salaries, and then we want to be entrepreneurs at the end of it mysteriously. And I think that you have to make that trade off. And so I hope that uh, you figure it out in your personal life, but I think that's the challenge for all of us.
already given for uh, education, already paying tax, and, you know, and I'm all tapped out. Well, part of the reason is because it's tax deductible, actually. So, <laughs> so, 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 so even if you don't want to give from your heart, give from your head. Because you're going to have to pay it in tax in any event. I think the cutoff is now 10 or 20,000 uh, per annum. Uh, it may even be higher. So you have a choice. You can either give it to the government or you can give it in causes that really motivate you. So it, it's actually a no-brainer in, you know, in, in the end. So thanks very much for coming. And Shlumelo, for you, uh, you don't have to declare this, actually. It's, <laughs> it falls under the threshold. So... Really, it was a great uh, um, talk you gave and very, very instructional, very motivational. And thanks very much. Thanks. Nice to see you again. And thanks, everybody. All right. Uh, let me do apologize to my regulars uh, for going the extra mile. I think the debate and the engagement was worthwhile uh, to, uh, to everyone. We'll take some pics after this. Uh, especially some of those who ask questions. Uh, he likes taking those pics uh, with uh, our guest and uh, our two uh, uninvited guests over here. Um, so we'll take some pics, please do. And then um, where are these pics posted? Okay, when you get the thank you note, we usually have a Flickr uh, 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 link then you click on it, you can see all these pics that we take here. Thank but you very much. We've got food that we've prepared for you, and also the book and, and some drinks. Uh, I always say at the end, do use these opportunities as networking opportunities. Uh, uh, I have evidence here of, uh, I had a meeting this afternoon with uh, Andrew uh, at, at Transnet, and he said to me, you know what, I've got some cards here of some young people that I met at this thing. And you need to contact these young people. They're doing some great work. Um, you know, so there are some nice networking opportunities um, that you can actually engage in. So please do that. Thank you very much. <laughs>